Okay, next movie, and I've said this before, but I really hate to dump on new children's films. They're in such short supply. I hate to do it, but I often do, especially in the animated film arena where the Disney folks have really upped the ante in terms of drawings and songs from The Little Mermaid to Toy Story now. Now comes Balto from another shop, and it just doesn't cut it, telling the adventure yarn of a gutsy sled dog that helps save the population of Nome, Alaska during a 1925 outbreak of diphtheria by carrying medicine through ice and snow. Mush! There's a romantic side to the story as the movie tries to cover all bets. Here's the dog's best friend, a Russian snow goose, advising Balto to romance a purebred husky, even though Balto himself is half husky, half wolf. Balto's voice is by Kevin Bacon, the goose by Bob Hoskins. This wolf business again. And what's wrong with being half and half, I'd like to know. Sometimes I wish like crazy I was half eagle. Why? Better profile for one thing. Hmm. And no one needs you for another. What about that female husky? Bridget Fonda supplies the voice of Jenna, who doesn't seem all that glamorous to me. <gasps> the Northern Lights. Oh. You're right. It's beautiful. And they're no Lady and the Tramp. And the whole drawing style seems sketchy to me, and the story is all over the map, from the rousing adventure to the sweet and cloying scenes. I saw Balto about six weeks ago, and I haven't thought about it since, which is most unlike me for a good children's well, film. Well, I liked it, Gene. It's not in the category oh, of the all. great animated films. Sure, the animation isn't at the Disney it level. It isn't. But the story was interesting. The fact you know, that they have to go and get this medicine, and he's got the evil dog who hey, didn't even at, mention, who was trying to set things right. up to blackmail him right. and make him look like the bad dog when really he's yeah, the hero. The, and then the local kids who are involved in the whole struggle. Roger. And then all of that stuff involving the ice and the snow if and the caves made, that they get caught in. They kids made. will enjoy this no, movie. No, I don't know. I don't know that to be true. Okay. If, if it had been a straight line on the adventure of it, mm -hmm. and it had been done in a, in, a, in a different kind of drawing style, mm -hmm. it could have been a rousing, a little well, bit more drawing with a drawing style. Oh, it's, you, do, you even said it so just a few seconds ago. You said it's sketchy. It isn't at the no, level. No, 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 no. You said it was sketchy. I said it wasn't at the level of the Disney stuff. Of course, stuff. it isn't it fully isn't, drawn. But it, it, it's, it's perfectly adequate to tell the story in an entertaining way. Boy, there's way. a real recommendation, adequate. No, Gene, just listen to me for a second. I have. This is a nice little children's adventure movie about... A brave dog, and I liked it. When you have kids okay? of your own, you won't send them to see nice little ones. You'll want quality. A split vote on the animated children's tale, Balto. Roger liked the story of the gutsy sled dog. I didn't like the way it was drawn or the way the story lurched all over the map emotionally. Next movie, and our next film is a terrific children's film, The Best Since Babe, a stop-motion animated tale called James and the Giant Peach about a little boy who goes to America from England flying on an airborne giant peach and making friends with the creatures that live inside. Marvelous things will happen. Poor glowworm. She's a little deaf. I, however, have exquisite hearing. Yeah? Well, listen to this. <laughs> Let's get out of here! Everything about this fantasy by Roald Dahl is fantastic, and the writing is smart enough to appeal to adults. You better not be near our peach. Oh, please, don't let them spray us. Spray us? They'll see the yank up there and come after us with a shovel. It happened to my brother. Awful. Split him right down the middle. Now I have two half-brothers. The intricate work in creating James and the Giant Peach has to be seen to be appreciated. Just look at the wealth of detail in this scene. What if we don't make it to New York? I'll die if I have to go back to the way I was. They can't make me. Nobody can make you do anything, James. If you do not like them, you are a brave boy. James and the Giant Peach is so good that I hope it's a hit so that its filmmakers, producer Tim Burton and director Henry Selleck, who made the wonderful The Nightmare Before Christmas in 1993, will continue to make more animated films. I also hope that parents who complain about the lack of good movies for children don't let James and the Giant Peach get away. It's great. It is great. And you know, what's interesting is that Disney, which is uh, the pioneer of kind of standard animation, right. is trying two other kinds of animation. Toy right. Story was all done in computers. Yeah. 
This is stop action, which was right. pioneered by Ray, Ray Harryhausen. Right. And each kind of animation opens up another realm of possibilities yeah. for what can be done with magic on the screen. Well, as didn't you just sit there sort of with your mouth agape yeah. as you were, I mean, they keep topping themselves. It would have been so easier if they were money-minded. Mm -hmm. You pull a couple of characters out, it's fantastic enough as it is. This it's is one just great a, shot after another. And you know, I had to kind of make a little ironic smile at the beginning because it starts out with live characters in beautiful soft focus right. pastels, James and his perfect childhood with his wonderful right. parents, and then bam, the parents are dead. I mean, in all of these movies, the parents are always dead, you know, something terrible happens so that the little kid can go on some kind of an adventure, and it's right. the premise, but here, they didn't even bother to explain it. It was just like a fly swatter. Okay. Two thumbs up, way up for James and the Giant Peach, a fabulous film for children and the adults who will accompany them. When we come back, a new Japanese animated film about cyborgs with minds of their own. Ghost in the Shell is next. Japanese animation, or anime, is the fastest growing underground cult in the movie world, even though these sleek and high-tech animated movies from Japan rarely surface in conventional theaters. Every year a few of them break through, however, and the new anime feature making the rounds now is Ghost in the Shell. As the movie opens, the beautiful Major Makoko Kusanagi, who is part human, part computerized machine, breaks up an illegal meeting involving trade and internet violation. I don't believe it. Thermoptic camouflage. Kusanagi and her sidekick, Bato, find themselves on the trail of the Puppet Master, a dreaded hacker whose intelligence exists only as a virus that seems to roam at will over the entire planetary network. Police! Everybody get down! Both sides in this struggle can become invisible, as in this fight scene between the Major and her quarry. Aw, out of ammo! Huh? And there are philosophical dialogue passages, in one of which we learn that the Puppet Master is, in fact, a computer program so advanced that it became aware of itself and now directs its own destiny. But it needs a body to occupy and wants to convince the beautiful Major to let it share her body. The ghost in the title refers to self-conscious intelligence, whether human or cybernetic, and Ghost in the Shell is unusually intelligent and challenging science fiction aimed at smart audiences. Well, there is certainly something to think about it, and that's a refreshing thing uh, from a lot of science fiction pictures, which are just purely doom and gloom. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a film dealing with artificial intelligence. Um, I like the look of the film. I like how simply moving the shadows, you know, just little movements on each character, they do it all the time, it always grabbed me. I was always staring at this film. A couple of other thoughts. One, um, it's, I think this is also, a, this whole genre is obviously a peek into the psyche of Japan mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. clearly there are people who are afraid of being robotized. Yes. And also, this business of using women. Uh, they have not gotten politically correct because, because the woman is constantly shown nude and her body is dissected and it's a way of, of, of subverting and, or of allowing and sexuality. Is, into and it. yet she is the heroine. And I understand so the that. two key things in these movies, yeah. one, you put your finger on both of them, one, the robotized thing, and second, women are very frequently the protagonists, even though yeah. they are still seen as sex objects. No question. Yeah. And two thumbs up for Ghost in the Shell, the Japanese animation film that may introduce a whole new audience to Japanimation. Okay, no director has won more Academy Awards in the last few years than a British animator named Nick Park, who created Wallace and Gromit, a dreamer with big ideas and his much more down-to-earth dog. The latest Wallace and Gromit adventure, named A Close Shave, won this year's Oscar for Best Animated Short Subject. And in it, Wallace has more or less solved the mystery of how to get up in the morning. Geronimo! Wallace and Gromit are in the window washing business and respond to an emergency call. A 
Close Shave is a 30-minute film that's part of a longer program called The Best of Aardman Animation. Another film in the package, also by Nick Park, provides zoo animals with middle-class British voices so they can talk about life behind bars. I feel very secure. <laughs> And uh, well looked after, very well looked after, and I've, I'm not worried about anything. I know whatever happens, they'll look after me and put, put me where I ought to be. The thing I like best about Wallace and Gromit is their complete eccentricity. This man and this dog seem to develop their relationship over many long years of Wallace's foolhardy schemes and Gromit's last-minute rescues. And at a time when Hollywood has more or less given up on animated shorts, Nick Park, with his three Oscars and a fourth nomination, shows that the art form still has a lot of life left. It's very entertaining, and I think you focus on just the thing. This is not, uh, when we think of animated figures, even stop action, we generally think of you know, warm-hearted, cuddly figures. Mm -hmm. And th this is not the case here. There are real characters. I think they may be at some level Laurel and Hardy-ish mm -hmm. in the sense of Hardy having great schemes and Laurel yeah. somehow uh -huh. doing something like that. Uh, it's very enjoyable. That's the best one. The close shave yes, is, it is. is the yes. best one in the group. Some of the other ones I didn't think were all that good, but I still recommend it. Okay. Two thumbs up for the quirky animated relationship between Wallace and Gromit on the best of Ardman animation. Coming up next, the eagerly awaited new Disney musical, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. He throws his gold and weeds at a bouquet. That's the way I'm upset every day. A classic novel has been simplified and put to song in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the latest Disney animated feature, and the result is a quite affecting story arguing for both tolerance of individuals and of a whole people who have been demonized for centuries. Disney's Hunchback, confined since birth to the cathedral by an evil judge, is comforted by three gargoyles who try to bring a little cheer into his sad life. Hey, 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 what gives? Aren't you going to watch the festival with us? I don't get it. Perhaps he's sick. Impossible. If 20 years of listening to you two hasn't made him sick by now, nothing will. The hunchback, called Quasimodo, is drawn to a beautiful gypsy woman named Esmeralda, who prays for tolerance of her oppressed group, establishing the central theme of the movie. God help the outcast children. Out to crush the gypsies is the evil Judge Frollo. This is a change from the Victor Hugo novel in which the church itself was portrayed as more of an evil controlling force. For 20 years I have been taking care of the gypsies, one by one. Judge Frollo also controls Quasimodo, who yearns to break free of his prison-like existence and mingle with the so-called normal people of Paris. All my life I wonder how it feels to pass a day not above them, but part of them, and out there living in the sun. Give me one day out there, all I ask is one. To hold forever. The Hunchback of Notre Dame has some beautiful songs that adapts the character of Quasimodo well, and the theme of tolerance is also well established. I fear, however, that this movie may be judged by the new measuring stick of American culture, box office receipts. I have no idea how this film is going to fare with the public, but it's a serious, well-made entertainment that should enthrall somewhat older children and clearly their parents as well. Thumbs up for me. Oh, thumbs way up for me, Gene. I love this movie, and I don't think just for older children, because although it does have supposed, serious subjects yeah. in it that they'll identify with. I was talking about 10 and up, 8 and up, okay, something fine, like yeah. that. There are just great visuals in this film. Yeah. The, the animation yeah. of Quasimodo as he clambers up and down that facade of Notre Dame. The overhead shot of the people. Oh, the, yes. The catacombs underneath Paris where the gypsies have their secret headquarters. Right. The dance sequence uh, involving Esmeralda. 
this is the best animated, the best written, the best thought through, uh, and the best sung Disney picture since The Beauty and the Beast. I, was, I liked I was it better. That I was a little bit, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed uh, Pocahontas okay. and Aladdin without being ecstatic about them. This is first rate. This is one of the best films of the year. It's well, really good. Well, I think uh, they did a very good job. And, and the whole notion of softening up Quasimodo's mm -hmm. looks, I, try, I mean, the challenge is, um, how do you present a character like this for a mass audience? Mm -hmm. And I think they did a very good job just on that point alone. I think he's clearly disfigured. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think they did it just right. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to guess at how this picture will be challenged. And I don't think it can be faulted in that regard well, I at all. think it's just great entertainment. I, I don't think it will be challenged. I think people wondered how it could be filmed, and now right. they can go see it, and they'll find out okay. how it could be filmed. Two very spirited thumbs up for The Hunchback of Notre Dame, one of the very best of the Disney animated features with great visuals, terrific musical numbers, and an unusual hero who adds a message to the adventure. Okay, next movie, and it too stars Robin Williams, but in a better role than Jack. Couldn't be worse. It's a familiar role for Williams, the genie in the latest Disney Aladdin sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Another straight-to-home video picture, but I think this one could have worked in theaters, and Robin Williams is the reason. He's absolutely arresting every time his character and voice appear on screen, as in the terrific opening number in celebration of the wedding of Aladdin and Jasmine. There's a party here in Agrabah, there's excitement in the air. People pouring in from near and far. The Jasmine and Aladdin are gonna have a wedding. There's a party here in Agrabah. Everybody will be there. So if you're a pauper or a show, do something with your hair. Even more entertaining is when the genie is the wedding coordinator. And he's even funnier, I think, than Martin Short's wedding arranger and father of the bride. That's right, we're taking you to the marriage of the millennium. And who is this coming on the lovely stretch, Camel? Oh, it's Cleopatra and Caesar, and they're bringing a salad. How wonderful. Oh, look, there's Osiris. Oh, Osiris! Osiris, can we have a word with you? Ah! Oh, no, the crowd is partying. Who's coming? It's Moses! Of course, the wedding doesn't go off without a hitch. Provided by the gang of 40 thieves. Got lots of grub to share. Pull up an easy chair. Pull up to the 40 thieves. A couple of good songs also helped make Aladdin and the King of Thieves one of the few decent children's films around this summer. I do recommend it. I enjoyed it, too. Uh, I thought that it had an interesting story that was a little right. bit more involved, a little more complex and yeah. challenging than I expected. I liked the animation, and once again, by bringing Robin Williams back, and he wasn't in the, second in the one. first Aladdin video right. sequel, right. Uh, I think they've gotten some of the magic that was in the first Absolutely. Aladdin Absolutely. It, it would have worked in theaters. I think they'll, I'm think i sure they do their calculus and well, say it will make more money at home video. No, they have said that they do not release sequels to their animation films as a company policy. So there you have it, at least not in theaters. Two thumbs up for Aladdin and the King of Thieves with Robin Williams reprising his marvelous genie role. This film is only available on home video starting next week. It's not in theaters. You guys make a big mistake. You're all washed up, Baldy. Baldy? He is not washed up. Michael's the greatest ever. Shut up. No. Michael Jordan goes one on ten with the Looney Tunes characters in Space Jam, his eagerly awaited film debut, one of the big holiday movies on this week's show. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune, and maybe Michael Jordan can't hit a curveball, but he sure hits Space Jam out of the park in a movie that's as much fun as a Bulls game, providing a perfect debut for Jordan playing himself. Being asked by Bugs Bunny to come to the rescue of the Looney Tunes characters threatened by some outer space tunes. They want to make us slaves, so we challenge them to a basketball game. You heard of the dream team? Well, we're the mean team. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, we need your help! And so Jordan has to teach the tunes to play hoops. Has anyone here ever played basketball? Um, I have. I'd like to try out for the team. Hey. Hi, my name is Lola Bunny. Lola? Jordan has the visual charisma of a big movie star. He's great to look at, and the script thankfully doesn't dumb him down, especially when Bill Murray joins the team. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I didn't know Dan Aykroyd was in this picture. Hey! 
Perhaps I could be of some assistance. That's how I feel, God. Thanks, bro. Now you get to live up your dream. Let's go. All right. All right. We need to score two Here's points. Here's how I see it. Doc. Yeah. You kick it into the girl bunny. Yeah. Down in the post. You dish it back out to the guy bunny. Got you it. swing it around the mic over here. You go to the hole Bill. and dominate. We own defense. Oh, yeah. Whoa. I don't play defense. The centerpiece of Space Jam is the big game between the Outer Space Monster Tunes and Jordan's gang. What are you looking at? <laughs> cool shoes. Ready? My only major quibble with the picture is that the animation of the outer space tunes before they become the attractive basketball monsters you just saw there is lame, bad Saturday morning TV stuff. But Michael, as is his usual role on the hardwood, saves the day on the big screen too. He's happy to be in this picture, and his enthusiasm is catching and absolutely charming. He wisely doesn't go the superstar fantasy route like Shaquille O'Neal did in the disastrous Kazam. No, he's simply Michael Jordan probably the best character he's ever going to play. Uh, I think he actually has the potential to play other characters, too. Yeah. I think that he has a natural ease on the screen that I was kind of surprised mm -hmm. to see, since so many basketball and sports stars, when they're transported to the movies, seem to be like fish out of water. Yeah. They don't know what to do next except to act like they're at a press well, conference Well, you know what? He's something. been used smartly because it's a logical extension of the way he was started out visually mm -hmm. in the TV ads with short sound bites. Yeah. They're a little bit longer here. But he's, an, he's, he's not given too much to do, just the right amount. Another thing I liked was the high-energy animation of this film. I think it's state-of-the-art animation, and it's very good. You criticized the animation right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think, in general, the animation in this movie is a step up for Warner Brothers. And I think what they're trying to do is position the Looney Tunes characters to be more competitive with Disney, which up until now has more or less owned the animation market. Um, I want to come back to Michael Jordan, because mm -hmm. I think that this guy has a big future in the okay. movies, and I want to point the way. It's not to do superhero kinds of stuff that's going to be thrown his way. He already is one. Mm -hmm. He's Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a script out there where he's supposed to play like a neighbor next door. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that he can do. If we know he's got the superpowers right inside his body. We don't need some manufactured genie mm -hmm. like Kazam and Shaquille O'Neal. Two thumbs up for the delightful Space Jam, which finds just the right comic note for the tricky interaction between Michael Jordan and the Looney Tunes. And our next movie is a holiday release called Beavis and Butthead Do America, a cheerfully subversive animated comedy featuring two foul-mouthed, dim-witted metalheads named Beavis and Butthead. Did I say dim-witted? I mean stupid, as we see in this clever scene where the film's director actually tries to help the boys figure out that their missing television set has been stolen. This is clever. Uh... <laughs> Uh, uh, Whoa, I think I just figured something out, Beavis. Uh, what? <laughs> this sucks. On the trail of the thief, the boys wind up in an airplane where sexual contact for the two virgins becomes a delightful possibility. Hi, can I help you with that? There you go, all set. I love you. Suspected of high crimes while on the run, the boys become the target of a federal manhunt. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead are cruder versions of the guys in Wayne's World. I suppose they are an acquired taste, but never having seen one of their shows on MTV, I was taken with their adolescent awkwardness, bravado, and vulnerability. Therefore, a modest recommendation of Beavis and Butthead do America for me. I recommend it, too. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I think, you know, there's a general impression that, in a way, 
the movie and the TV series celebrate Beavis and Butthead, and I don't really think they do. I think they're a satire of this kind of couch potato, uh, disaffected attitude, and that Beavis and Butthead are not really presented in all that positive a light, and I, I kind of enjoyed the satire aimed against them and against stupidity well, in general. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the world that they, you know, moral authority coming down is held in even lower regard than Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> I guess that Mike Judge, the, the creator of yeah. the show, uh, has maybe a low opinion of just about everything, but it's done very, very well. Okay, coming up next, Hercules, the new Disney animated feature. When you smile, the girls went wild with... But Father, I've beaten every single monster I've come up against. I, I'm, I'm the most famous person in all of Greece. I'm, I, I, I'm an action figure. <laughs> A sly little in joke about action figures there is Hercules, the Greek god of strength, has a chat with his father, Zeus, in Hercules, the sassy and entertaining new full length animated feature from Disney. This is the first time the Disney animators have plundered Greek mythology for a subject, and they found a wealth of rich material, including a first rate villain. His name is Hades, his voice is done by James Woods, and his hair turns blue or red, reflecting his emotions like a mood ring. What? The fates are here, and you didn't tell me? A memo to me, maim you after my meeting. The look of the film is a little different this time. Disney turned to Gerald Scarf, who was famous in Great Britain for his political caricatures, to suggest an edgier look. That's Danny DeVito's voice as Phil, the little satyr. The evil Hades recruits a beautiful creature named Megara, or Meg for short, to seduce Hercules. And also featured in this scene is Pegasus, Hercules' winged horse, who is friendly, but not very bright. Uh, how, how, how'd you get mixed up with the... Uh, Pinhead with hooves? Well, you know how men are. They think no means yes, and get lost means take me, I'm yours. <laughs> the theory is that Meg will bamboozle Hercules, but no Hades, worries. pain and panic find out... It's not going to be that simple. He comes on with his big innocent farm boy routine, but I could see through that in a Peloponnesian minute. Wait a minute. Wasn't Hercules the name of that kid we were supposed to? Oh, my God! Run for it! So you took care of him. One of the movie's nice touches is to supply a Greek chorus in the form of the singing muses who have the style of a black gospel group. Back when the world was new, the planet Earth was dead. And everywhere gigantic brutes called titans ran amok. Hercules is a wonderfully entertaining movie, overflowing with inspirations from Greek mythology and with a lot of satiric cross-references to more current myths. The movie is brighter and more cheerful than the two most recent Disney animated features, Pocahontas and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And although it lacks the depth and emotion of Hunchback, it is lighter and more playful with a touch that is a real delight. Well, again, Roger, I was disappointed by a big mm. summer movie. Mm. And on the drawing scale, I think you've, you've named the one thing that I did like and the one character that I do like a lot, and that's Hades. It's mm -hmm. well done, and James Woods is very good. Yes. He, his, yes, he, he does is. the spritzing that uh, uh, Robin Williams did as well. Yeah. And Scarf's angular look is good. But so much of the film, to me, is soft, rounded animation that I uh, associate with the wannabes of Disney that are, are so lame. Uh, and I'm thinking of the world of Zeus, and I'm thinking of the drawing of Zeus and also Hercules himself. Compare that to The Little Mermaid, I think an underrated mm -hmm. film. And compare Zeus, who is a complete bore compared to Triton, King Triton mm -hmm. in The Little Mermaid, and uh, The Little Mermaid versus... Hercules, boring. The songs, the supporting characters. There isn't a song here that you can hum. I can't hum. Well, you know, Nothing's memorable. I right gave, on the songs. I would, I would put Little Mermaid right up at the top, along with Beauty and the Beast, exactly. among the. Re and I would put this one notch down. But I certainly still recommend it. No, you no. Know, I had a good time. I enjoyed no. myself. I, 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 did. I like the, I like the mythology. I like the characters. I like the. Uh, 
uh, Maybe, the whole tone of the film. But Roger, the look, respond to some of my criticisms because th I'm getting the sense that you think I'm right. The songs are not memorable. The drawing of hate of of the world of Zeus. I never know if the songs are memorable till I hear them three or four times. Look at you telling me that Hakuna Matata was going to be on everybody's lips for the rest of the. It century. is, and everyone who heard you said it knows it and can sing no, it. No, it's not true. Okay. Well, in any event, that's a ringing defense, by the way, folks, of of, I, I, uh, of I, this movie. I would be happy <laughs> to go up on an and tell you once again that I think this is an extremely entertaining, you have it very respond. pleasant, bright. Film. Film. It doesn't matter if, if Zeus is that interesting because Zeus is not a major character you're telling in the way story. that Triton was. You're telling story. Do you think Hercules is the least bit interesting as a character? Yes. Not me. Yes, I did. Not me at all. Yes, he was. There we go. A split decision on Hercules, the animated feature. I really enjoyed its light and bright look at Greek mythology, but Gene felt it was not up to the high standards of previous Disney animated films. When we come back, Christopher Robin disappears and a little bear goes looking for him. You are just in time for the best part of the day. What part is that? The part when you and me become we. Winnie the Pooh climbs to the top of a tree and greets the new day with his best pal Christopher Robin in a scene there from Pooh's Grand Adventure. This is a new animated Disney feature that's being released directly on video without going to theaters first. And I was surprised how faithful it was to the tone and spirit of the classic Pooh books. Oh, I want to be with you forever. I want you right here beside me forever. One thing you should know. No matter where I go, we'll always be together, forever and ever. And here's another sweet scene. The clouds are perfect too, and here I am with you. What could be more right? Who's Grand Adventure is a simple, low-key story, best, I think, for younger children, which is as it should be since Pooh is aimed at that very age group. I thought it was charming, and <clears throat> I'm saying it from my age group, uh, mm -hmm. in, in this sense that uh, it was quiet. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't uh, the souped up, as you said, the spin, you know, the Saturday morning frenzy. Mm -hmm. That song is a beautiful song. There wasn't a single song in Hercules that anyone is singing or they're gonna remember. Mm -hmm. That song might work. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that there is, a, there is something to the story. It's about believing that you're, it's, it's saying that you're stronger than you believe, smarter than you think. Those kind of things, messages are put mm -hmm. through, and it's not talking down, it's written to the character. I also like the look of the animation, yes. which reminded me of Hercules, because once again, what they're using is that soft watercolor background. It's not so hard-edged, and I thought that that worked. I preferred this in the drawing I'm style sure that Hercules did. Yes, I did. Okay, next movie, and our next film is the animated feature Anastasia, offering some very pretty pictures while telling the story of an orphaned Russian princess Maybe. who doesn't know she's really royal. Her speaking voice is by Meg Ryan, her singing voice, Liz Calloway. It's like a memory from a dream. Dancing bears, painted wings, Wells concoct a scheme by which they're going to promote this uh, poor little girl into pretending to be Anastasia, the long-lost legitimate heiress to the Romanov throne in exile in Paris. You do kind of resemble her. The same blue eyes. The Romanov eyes. Nicholas's smile. Alexandra's chin. Oh, look, she even has the grandmother's hand. The force of evil in this picture is its least interesting element. The evil Rasputin is an utterly generic cartoon bad guy in my opinion. Come my minions, rise for your master. Let your evil shine. And to the dark of the night, in the dark of the night, she'll be mine. The storyline has Anastasia reuniting with the Dowager Empress, and these characters are well drawn. Listen, haven't you been listening? I've had enough. I don't care how much you have fashioned this girl to look like her, sound like her, or act like her. In the end, it never is her. Eventually, the promoters learn that this really is the celebrated Anastasia. The heir to the Russian throne. And you will walk out of her life forever. But 
Princesses don't marry kitchen boys. How does this Anastasia from the Fox Entertainment Empire measure up to the recent Disney collection of outstanding animated pictures? Well, it's not at the same level in terms of its musical score, to be sure. as say Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid, my modern favorites. It doesn't have the same caliber of songs, but it does have a Cinderella quality to its story that is appealing. And I think the central character of Anastasia is as magnetic as, say, Ariel and the Little Mermaid. That ultimately is enough for me to give a marginal recommendation of this movie for older children. I'm not sure little ones are going to be able to follow the story. Oh, I liked it a lot more than you did, I think, Gene. And mm -hmm. there are a couple of points I would make. First of all, this is a fascinating story. I mean, I was asking myself, how can they make an animated musical about Anastasia? But the story of the fraud, the the imposter who isn't an imposter, that's right. fascinating. Secondly, lots of exciting action sequences, including the runaway train. And third, I thought that Rasputin was a great villain, not only in terms of the fact that his body is always coming to pieces and having to be screwed back together again, but also in that his green little goblin representatives are always following everybody everywhere they go and causing trouble. I thought he was first rate as a villain. No, I thought that. I thought he looked stock. I mean, really. I oh, mean, he I... looked like Rasputin. He looked exactly oh, like Rasputin. No, in live in live action films that we've both seen, uh -huh. Ras, Rasputin was more scary, in my opinion. No, sir. This is a real good villain, and okay. I think it's a very good movie. I would have liked a better explanation of what was going on in Russia at the time. That, That's where they that really fell down. Yeah, we don't no, no, get, I mean, it's, yeah, it's we embarrassing. Don't, we don't get that. Let me ask you one more question. Yeah, I mean, why a place didn't where they, they because I party. agree with you, the music isn't that great. Why didn't they use the movie, the, the movie song Anastasia? I don't understand. Maybe why they not? Don't, they couldn't get the rights. Song. I don't oh, know. Oh, they could have gotten the rights. It's a matter of writing a check, and you got the rights, okay. just like that. Two thumbs up for Anastasia. We both like the lead character. Roger liked Rasputin more than I did. And coming up next, Mulan, the new Disney animated adventure. My ancestors sent a little lizard to help me. Hey, dragon, dragon, not lizard. I don't do that tongue thing. By order of the emperor, one man from every family must serve in the imperial army. Father, you can't go. Mulan. Enemy troops swarm down on the Great Wall of China, and the call goes out for all able-bodied men to defend the kingdom in Mulan, the new Disney animated feature. But the teenage girl named Mulan doesn't want her old and ailing father to go to war, so she plays a trick. She cuts off her hair, disguises herself as a boy, and goes off to volunteer in his place. Uh, sorry you had to see that, but you know how it is when you get those uh, manly urges. Of course, there's a comic sidekick, a little dragon, with a voice by Eddie Murphy. Who are you? Who am I? Who am I? I am the guardian of lost souls. I am the powerful, the pleasurable, the indestructible Mushu. Oh, <laughs> pretty high, man. Milan is a fresh adaptation of a classic Chinese folktale filled with color and excitement as the young girl brilliantly figures out a way to win a battle which attracts the attention of Shan Yu, the leader of the Hun forces. <laughs> Mulan is one of the very best recent Disney animated adventures, original, fresh, great to look at, and with a story that reaches a little more and takes bigger chances than is usually the case. It's the kind of family movie that adults can enjoy on their own. Its only weakness is in its songs, which didn't seem especially memorable to me, but this isn't a musical anyway, really. It's a thrilling adventure, and some of the animated sequences, like a wall of enemy horsemen racing down a snow-covered mountainside, are as good as anything the studio has done. Well, Roger, we, we simply differ here. Uh, comparing it to uh, other recent Disney uh, animated features featuring young women as uh, the center of the film, I think this really comes up short compared with uh, Ariel in The Little Mermaid, her story, uh, Belle in Beauty and the Beast. I did not oh, get behind I think, this and, one and at all. And Pocahontas, too. I think that the thing here is that she is freestanding. She is the person who, out of her own will and her own imagination, controls her own destiny. She's not just trying to you know, go along with the team as they are in the other pictures. Well, I actually, think she's the most I, independent Disney heroine I've seen. Well, actually, I think all three of those uh, young women in the other features were quite independent. They were not going along. Um, one didn't want to be a mermaid, if you recall. She wanted to be human, basically. Yeah, that's she wasn't true, going but along. But nevertheless... Uh, her masquerade, mm -hmm. frankly, wasn't as uh, good as uh, Barbara Streisand and Yentl. I didn't feel a sense of jeopardy. In Yentl, 
there was, you know, her whole life could collapse. Well, I had never felt that. This, there's got to be some kind of a difference between an adult drama and a family animated cartoon, don't you think, in terms of how serious it can be taken and how seriously we're supposed to take well, it? It's you, a fantasy. You're saying, are you saying we can't take this film seriously? Well, I think that Sounds you, like you it. take it seriously as an animated family cartoon. You don't take right. it. You don't compare it to Yentl. It doesn't. They well, come out of different I'm just worlds. Talking, no, I'm, not, I'm comparing one element, and here's another one. Maybe you'll object to this. In terms of what she does, the, the notion of a young woman being strong in battle, G.I. Jane. She. I didn't. I thought you know the story or the saga, the endurance of Demi Moore was more impressive. I, I'm just aghast. I don't understand. I mean, this is a the kind of genre that it's in. I it just does it, a wonderful and job. And I compared it earlier to Beauty and the Beast and to The Little Mermaid. Same well, genre. I just think that basically and my bottom line right. is... And listen, let me do, you did the same thing. You know where you did it? When you said the songs weren't good because the songs in these other pictures were spectacular. Well, that's what I said. I, I, but I, I, I think the, but that's what you're doing. The you're comparing here, it. The story, the characterization, the action, Actually, the originality, you, the drawing, on the subject, it's wonderful. On the subject of artwork, if you look in the backgrounds, you're going to see a lot of blank walls. I was very surprised. Not at all. What you see is, it reminded me of the great Japanese cartoon artist Hiroshiga from yeah. two centuries ago. Not in the way I saw the picture, not at all. A split decision on Mulan. Gene thought it came up short compared to other comparable Disney films. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is a delightful and visually breathtaking animated feature named Kiki's Delivery Service. It's the work of Hayao Miyazaki, whose cartoons have outgrossed Disney features in Japan and whose entire output has been purchased by Disney for release in this country. I love Miyazaki's work. I admire its visual grace and beauty, and I love the way it identifies with its young heroes and heroines who are more like ordinary kids than mythical superheroes. There's one thing not ordinary about Kiki, however. She's a young witch in training, and when she reaches her teenage years, she sets off with her pet cat, Gigi, to find a new town in which to practice witchcraft. The movie has been lovingly dubbed by Disney with an American cast, including Kirsten Dunst as Kiki and the late Phil Hartman as Gigi, her cat. Gigi, climb up and turn on the radio. I don't think I can handle it. Can you do it? Oh, great. Now I'm suddenly the flight attendant. In a new town, Kiki gets a job as a delivery girl for a pregnant baker named Asono, an Earth Mother voiced by Tress McNeil. Oh, my God. Kiki makes a pal, a young boy named Tombo, who goes on a dirigible ride and gets in a lot of trouble. Kiki! Tombo! Ah! Oh, oh. The animation of Miyazaki is only now becoming familiar in this country, but he's the equal, I think, of the Disney animators at their best. In the pipeline is Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke, which until Titanic was the highest grossing film in Japanese history. Kiki's delivery service is direct-to-video. It's in stores right now and I loved it. I enjoyed it very much too, Roger. It has a different visual style yes, than the classic Disney uh, animators, and so that's one thing that catches your eye. Mm -hmm. But the story, I mean, Kiki is really almost on a conveyor belt mm -hmm. through this uh, story. And I was fascinated by someone who followed her raptly, never looked away, mm -hmm. my three-year-old son. Yeah. Now, that amazed me. He happens to, uh, his favorite things are uh, monster truck rallies and that kind of <laughs> stuff, you know what I mean? He's a real boy. He liked this gentle story about a girl walking, you know, through, I mean, oh, there's exciting se uh, sequences and they're well animated, but not a word from him. And this kid likes action. It's surprising right. that there is a narrative here and kids hook into it. Right. Two thumbs up for Kiki's Delivery Service, a delightful animated feature new in video stores. Coming up next, Woody Allen, Sharon Stone, and Sylvester Stallone lend their voices to some amazing insects in the new animated comedy, Ants. In case you haven't noticed, we ants are running this show. We're the lords of the earth. Hey, don't talk to me about Earth, okay? Because I just spent all day hauling it around. You know, my, my mother never had time for me. You know, when, you, when you're the middle child, in a family of five million, you don't get any attention. I mean, how is it possible? The voice of Woody Allen as an animated ant named Z, an ant described as an ant with ideas in the visually striking, no make that, the visually stunning animated feature called Ants, which mixes humor and social satire and adventure so well, it will hold more appeal for adults than for kids. That's the 
It is the Woody Allen ant who is the star of the show with his clever commentary on what a drone it is to be a drone. I, I was not cut out to be a worker. I'll tell you right now. I, I, I feel physically inadequate. I, I, my whole life, I've never, I've never been able to lift more than 10 times my own body weight. And, and when you get down to it, handling dirt is, you know, is not my idea of a rewarding career. His nonconformist attitude ultimately puts him in conflict with the officious general of the colony, voiced by Gene Hackman. Christopher Walken supplies the voice of the colonel. There is time right now for a personal moment. We're a few seconds ahead of schedule. Excellent. Ooh, princess. <laughs> well, a few seconds isn't much, but I guess if it's quality time. So, how was your day? Anything interesting happen? We declared war. Declared war? Boy. Talk about a rough day. Sir, I hate to interrupt, but time stands still for no end. That's Sharon Stone supplying the voice of Princess Bala, the daughter of the colony's queen. Bala becomes Z's ladybug. What a bunch of losers, mindless zombies capitulating to an oppressive system. Hi. Want to dance? Absolutely. Another part of the story involves Z's search for a legendary land of plenty called insectopia but once there the ants find it's sticky going when there's gum afoot get me out of here bala now each shot of huge numbers of objects in ants and there are many is impressive watching this film is one wow event after another on a more subtle level, I also appreciate the attention to detail that went into animating each blade of grass into a fibrous post. That, an exciting battle between ants and an army of termites, and letting Woody Allen, I assume, write many of his characters' lines, marks ants as one of the major film achievements of this movie year. Boy, I agree with you, and I agree, too, when you said that this movie appealed to adults as much oh, as, or maybe oh, more. more than to children, because it reminded me of Animal Farm in the sense oh. that it takes these ants in their colony and finds parallels with society. As, for example, when, uh, when Woody Allen says about the termites, instead of attacking them, why don't we just give them some campaign contributions? <laughs> and I, I just love the look of the film when the ants form into that great ball and swing back and forth, working together. And term the termites. Oh, the termites. And hey, the grasshopper? Grasshopper is enormous to an ant. Also, I've complained on this show about Woody Allen's character getting tired, his, you know, neurotic persona mm -hmm. getting tired. He brings it all back with this character. I, and maybe he found that he wasn't dealing with himself, liberating. He adapted his own dialogue, and it's, it's really funny. Yeah, and there's a kind of an in-joke because Woody Allen is so famous for detesting and having a phobia about insects of all kind, and now he gets one of his best roles playing one. And finally, two big thumbs up for the original looking animated feature, Ants. Well, now here we have a show with two movies that depend heavily on computer right. uh, special effects. Uh, what Dreams May Come and Ants. And in both cases, what the directors have done is use the power of the computer to express their own vision wonderfully instead of just using it as a shortcut. Filmmakers are more computer literate than ever before. And we're seeing the full flower of the use of the computer here in film. And coming up next, Simba and friends return for a new adventure, The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. It is a girl. Girl! Girl! Boy! He lives in you. Well, look who has grown up after four circles of life have passed. Yes, it's Simba, now the proud father of a baby lioness in The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, a satisfactory continuation of the adventures of memorable animals introduced in one of the most popular films of all time. This new next generation story parallels the conflicts of the original with the children of adversaries. For example, here Simba confronts Zira a follower of Simba's old enemy, Uncle Scar. She has a grand dream of her own for her son, Kobu. 
Take him and get out. We're finished here. Oh, oh no, Simba. We have barely begun. <laughs> but wouldn't you know it, a father's nightmare. Of all the lions in the forest, his princess likes his adversary's son. Their childhood friendship carries into adulthood. Oh, look. There's one that looks like a baby rabbit. See the fluffy tail? Yeah. Hey, there's one that looks like two lions killing each other for a scrap of meat. <laughs> I've never done this before. I like the variety of animals, the familiar drawing style, but what I found wanting in The Lion King 2 was original songs, even remotely equal to any from the first movie. Well, that's no Hakuna Matata. And with that and its familiar story, it makes perfectly good sense that Lion King 2 is not being released in movie theaters now, but directly into video stores, where it is certainly worthy of being rented, if not purchased. So only a marginal thumbs up for me. Marginal for me, too, and I think you used the right word uh, in your intro to this review when you said it was satisfactory. Yeah. It's more or less what you are hoping for or expecting as a made-for-video sequel to The Lion King. It's not a, uh, at the level of the theatrical releases that Disney does, but on the other hand, if you're interested in what happened to the characters, <laughs> you want to see kind of a Romeo and Juliet uh, scenario played out in the Serengeti, then it, it's fun on that level. But uh, you know what I'm talking about with the songs? Yeah. You couldn't hum, I couldn't hum one from the picture. Nope. And as we know, people are still humming Maku, the, Matkuna, Takuna, Makata, Makuta. Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Makata. Yeah. They're probably, well, yeah. uh, I don't know if they're humming. A name on every list. I think, yeah. actually, if they know the song, they remember the lyric. Okay. <laughs> Two thumbs up for the direct-to-video sequel, The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Coming up next, A Bug's Life, a new animated feature from the makers of Toy Story. Always cast me as the broom, the pole, the stick, a splinter. You're a walking stick. It's funny. Now let me tell you how things are supposed to work. The ants pick the food. Oh. The grasshoppers eat the food. It's a bug-eat-bug -bug world out there. There's some splendor, but a whole lot of warfare in the grass in A Bug's Life, the latest computer-generated insect film of the year. Did I ever think I would ever say that sentence? <laughs> and who ever thought we'd get two in one year? A Bug's Life isn't just ants. As we go one step up the food chain to a grasshopper population that enjoys harvest normally supplied by the ant colony and is very angry when one year the ants don't come through. The voice of the lead hopper in the film is supplied by Kevin Spacey. Let's just think about the logic, shall we? Let's just think about it for a second. If it was up there, would I be coming down here to your level looking for it? A Bug's Life was made by the same animation house, Pixar, that made the great-looking Toy Story. Half the pleasure of the movie is the dazzling way it looks more than its lame story about an ant called Flick, who wants to lead the ant colony into a labor-saving efficiency and rid them of the grasshopper threat. To do that, Flick sets out to recruit some bigger bugs who can help the ants. break up the action, the movie features a play within a play as a variety of insects put on a circus act for an impresario named P.T. Flea. P.T., what's the point? Not now, Slim. What's the point of going out there? They'll only laugh at me. That's because you're a clown! A Bug's Life is missing a character like the Woody Allen character from Ants who gave that film an adult sensibility. This film is more for kids. Francis, leave them alone. They have poo poo hands. Not again. There's no question that A Bug's Life loses some of its appeal because of its release following the movie Ants just seven weeks ago. 
I don't know if this can be justified logically, but I'm going to give it a marginal recommendation for people who haven't seen Ants and are unfamiliar with the animation style, but I can't recommend it as highly if you have seen Ants because in comparison, A Bug's Life comes up short. Uh, I give it more than a marginal thumbs up. I enjoyed it uh, just flat out. I like Ants too. I think the two movies are more or less comparable in how much they entertain me. And this one does have a wonderful look. They are doing things with 100% computer animation there mm -hmm. uh, that gives the Pixar studio its own look, Correct. different from other animated Correct. films. Yeah. And there is a flow and a, a grace in the animation here that is, that is bewitching. And then I like the story, too. I like the whole business of uh, miniaturization, the, the way that the rainstorm is like they're being bombed from space by giant water bombs, yeah, well, and uh, yeah. the way that the ant hive organizes itself. I, I, I like both of these films. I, I'm, I'm happy that we got both of them. Uh, I'm giving thumbs up to this picture, too, oh. and uh, it's just that ants, because of the Woody Allen character, had that extra dimension, that, that adult quality. Woody Allen gave it a, more of an adult quality, but I like the fact that the hero of this film is a little inventor who has all kinds of bright ideas for how he's going to be able to automate the harvest and so forth. He's a good character, too. Flick. Two thumbs up for A Bug's Life. Okay, next movie, and it's the Rugrats movie. We cover the waterfront, don't we? <laughs> it's based, of course, on the popular Nickelodeon cable channel series that looks at the world literally from the ground-level point of view of toddlers. In the movie version, the Pickles family and its kids have to deal with a new addition, an infant boy named Dylan, nicknamed Dill. Get it? Dill Pickles. Uh, Dill can be pretty tough to get along with, huh? But sometimes little brothers, they aren't everything you'd hope they'd be. That's why big brothers have got to have faith. And one day, you'll see. A staple of the TV show and the film, both aimed at a young audience, is toilet talk. A baby yip, extra fancy. A baby poops in his panties. The main story has the Rugrats crawling away from home and encountering adventure in the woods. But no interesting characters there, just some runaway circus monkeys and a wolf. Now, I'm about seven times the target age for this picture. But not that long ago, as a younger dad, I got a kick out of watching the TV show with my pre-teenage daughters. I think the Rugrats movie is not quite at the level of the TV series. Well, you know, I'm seven times the target age, too. I, li I thought it was bright. I thought it was lively. I thought it was fun within certain limits. I can't recommend it. To anyone over the Rugrats target demographic, I really can't. This is not a movie uh, for, for anyone who doesn't already watch Rugrats on television. Yeah. I have a feeling for them it's going to be just fine and they're going to like it a lot because it has that kind of simplistic, uh, child-oriented, poo and pee-based humor that they just love. Well, okay, there's a, there's a hearty recommendation. <laughs> That's not gonna. That's not gonna pop up in any quote ad you're gonna see. <laughs> <laughs> Has the poo and pee type material that you like when we come back. <laughs> and finally, two thumbs down on the Rugrats movie. Roger thought it would only appeal to little ones and not much to anyone else. Our first film is the strikingly animated feature, The Prince of Egypt, which tells the same story from bull rushes to the Red Sea as the biblical spectacular the Ten Commandments from the 50s. And here, the baby Moses is discovered by the Egyptian queen, voiced by Helen Mirren. Come, Ramesses. We will show Pharaoh your new baby brother. Moses. Moses grows up and is treated like a prince, he is raised with a natural rival, a genuine prince, the pharaoh's son, Ramses, voiced by Ray Fiennes. Moses' voice here is supplied by Val Kilmer. Come on, Moses, admit it, you've always looked up to me. Yes, but it's not much of a view. 
Eventually, Moses learns the truth when he encounters his long-lost siblings, Miriam, voiced by Sandra Bullock, and Aaron, voiced by Jeff Goldblum. She's, she's exhausted from the day's work. Uh, not that it was too much. We, we quite enjoyed it, but, but uh, she's confused and knows not to whom she speaks. I know to whom I speak, Aaron. I know who you are, and you are not a prince of Egypt. Miriam. I always think music plays a big role in the success of an animated feature, and the Prince of Egypt has some memorable songs. How do you judge what a man is worth by what he builds or buys? You can never see with your eyes on earth. Look through heaven's eyes. Look at your life. Look at your life. Look at your life. So what we have here is a classic story, well told, beautifully drawn, with an occasional musical sequence that's memorable. That's more than enough for me to give thumbs up to The Prince of Egypt. Oh, I get thumbs up too, Gene. I thought this was a wonderful animated film, and all the more so because it tells a genuine, legendary, and historical story and doesn't necessarily cute it up into all kinds of stuff with little, uh, you know, cute little Egyptian birds dancing around and so forth. And the thing that kind of struck me. Not long ago, I saw Cecil B. DeMille's original silent version of the Ten Commandments, and then, of course, he made the famous the sound one, yeah. version. And this has now become kind of like a movie archetype with the slaves groaning as they try to pull these enormous rocks to build the, the pyramids and the slave drivers and the pharaoh and so forth. And it becomes an enormously powerful story that actually it was DeMille who first set into motion because his visual ideas from the 20s are still being used now in the 90s. We both know that animation was originally used to make fables yes. come alive, classic stories. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, of course, one of the key stories in human history, and you're quite right. It has an energy, even though we know it. So we, and actually, in, in a sense, because we know it, Yeah. We can sit back and appreciate the artfulness of what the What about the great scene everybody remembers from seeing Ten Commandments on television, The Parting of the Red Sea? It has yeah. done so well here. I mean, the way that the animation makes the water seem to stand up yeah. looks really so much more convincing than the special effects in the live action. Film. Also, I felt that during the story, a little religiosity did creep through. Uh -huh. There was some moments when you thought a value system was being presented. I agree with you. You know, I love animation. I love it most of all when it gets a little bit off the beaten path because mm -hmm. it doesn't all have to be just cute little talking animals. It right. can sometimes deal with great stories and great concepts. And here's an example where it does. Okay. Two thumbs up for the biblical animated epic, The Prince of Egypt. It opens on December 18th.